We're here to talk about financial services and FOFA and what as accountants your reaction might be to it, what some of your options are and what's happening. Um, and we're very, very privileged to have with us all of our five financial service partners. Um, so I think that it's a really, really good opportunity to have a really good session and to ask as many questions as you want. So I'll just give you very briefly, before I introduce them, I'll just give you very briefly um, an idea of how we sort of came to this point in time. Because as you probably all know, we've been talking about financial services and FOFA for quite a long time. And we started the journey quite a few years ago now, where we went to market to look for financial service partners that we could introduce our members to. Um, and we've sort of continued that journey and FOFA's sort of changed, changed and everything's evolved and the, the macro environment has changed a lot with it. And so we've got, um, we went back to tender, we've done two tender processes and we've expanded our panel to include five AFSL holders. And that way we believe that we can give members as much choice as possible. And all the early research that we did, and we spent a year researching, modelling, etc., cetera, um, showed us um, that our members really, really did want choice when it came to partners in financial services. So that's why we've now got the expanded panel. And I'll now, I'll now introduce you to them. Um, I will then ask each of them to just give you a quick rundown of their various companies, and that will give you a flavour of the differences. Um, I will then ask each of them a particular question just to set the context, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, I've asked... Uh, we've got seating in alphabetical order by surname. <laughs> so we'll st yeah, that's right. So we've got Stuart Abley to my left. Stuart is the head of SMSF Advice. Then we've got Matt England, Managing Director of Securitor. We've got Grant O'Reilly, Managing Director of Capstone Financial Planning. Then we've got Dan Powell, Head of SFG Alliance Services and Tony Zuli, Director with Accountable Financial Group. So I'll now ask each of them just to give you a very quick rundown of some of the background of their various companies, starting with Stuart. Thanks, Vicky. Um, yeah, look, most of you are probably at the session yesterday, so um, I'll make this very quick. But SMSF Advice is a, a licensee that specialises in the SMSF area and industry, hence the name, obviously. Um, we sort of pride ourselves on being a modern licensee with no conflicted remuneration, fee-based, uh, comply with APES 230, and um, we only license uh, public practitioners. So um, we are a purpose-built accountancy-specific licensee. We're also owned by AMP, and as I said to you all yesterday, that's uh, an incredible positive thing um, after I deal with the perceived negative upfront um, of an institution ownership and uh, have plenty of uh, resources and services to supply you through our licensee, and it's all been developed with the accountant in mind. I think that's it, Vicky. Okay, Matt. Uh, so, Matt England, let me just start by saying it's, uh, it's a privilege to be here, and we welcome the opportunity to work with, uh, with the IPA. Uh, uh, so, I am part of the uh, BT licensee network. Uh, the Securitor licensee has been here around for 28 years. Uh, we were started by financial advisors and have worked with accountants since the very inception. Some of you who have been around in, in industry and practice for quite some time will remember the PACT accounting licence. Uh, Securitor has, um, as part of its long history and heritage, a great association with their accounting fraternity. Uh, we have in excess of 70% of the financial advisors who are with Securitor are actually also accountants. So we've got some history and understanding of the challenges that you face into and the opportunities that either working with a financial advisor or having financial advice as part of a multidiscipline business has uh, for groups such as yourselves. Um, uh, like Stu, we are actually a uh, uh, wholly owned subsidiary of a large institution, so we are backed by Westpac. We're part of the BG Group. Well, good morning, everyone. It's still, uh, still morning. Um, Grant O'Reilly is my name. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm the Managing Director of Capstone Financial Planning. Capstone is one of Australia's uh, largest and most recognised independent licensees. Um, we're a national organisation that is in its 13th year of operation, born in about uh, early 2002. Um, as in saying that we're national, we, uh, 
we, like uh, what Matt just said, probably 60 to 70 per cent of our practices are accounting based practices that are either uh, accountants in their own right with a financial planner inside or part of a network. So we run a high percentage of accountants. Capstone uh, is quite unique in the independent space because it's one of probably only two AFSLs in Australia that run its own full service back room. So the wonderful service that uh, you can access through uh, my colleagues' uh, institution's back room, uh, you can also access through Capstone and that sets us uh, solidly, solidly apart. We also have a tiered authorisation system that uh, a lot of you have already inquired about that provides licensing at very various levels so you can move through those as you need to. Thank you, Vicky. Thanks, Grant. Dan? Uh, yes, so, so I work for, I'm head of uh, SFG Alliance Services. SFG Alliance Services uh, is part of a company called IWF. It's a listed company. It's top 100 in market cap. It's about $3 billion. Uh, we have a number of dealer groups that you may be familiar with under that sort of IWF banner. Bridges, uh, Shadforth, Lonsdale, uh, Audmanet, um, uh, Consultant, Plan B. Uh, so an extensive range of uh, sort of AFSLs for self-employed advisors. Uh, the business that I'm in is we provide B2B services. So we provide support services to those uh, advisors who want to establish their own or run their own AFSL. Thanks, Dan. Tony? Good morning, everyone. Tony Zuli from the Accountable Financial Group. Uh, we're the little guy here. Um, so we're a privately owned organisation, um, we've been uh, operating for about four years, the licence itself has been operating for three years, or a little bit over three years. We are sole, uh, sole purpose uh, licence and other services for accountants and accounting practices only. We do not licence financial planners unless they are uh, formally involved in some way, shape or form with the accounting practice. We provide solutions in terms of your initial training requirements. Uh, we provide the licensing solution and then we are also tailoring products and services specifically based on research with accountants and their clients. Um, we provide scaled advice services and I'm more than happy to explain a bit later on because I know there's a question that Vicky would like to ask about scaled advice uh, which allows you to actually progress through a range of different advice services starting with something quite simple and then moving through as you build your advice practice. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, everyone. So I'll just start by asking some questions just to sort of set some context. Um, starting with Stuart, um, in the last five years that I've been talking to accountants and not just IPA members but accountants generally, I've heard a lot of stories about, um, you know, how financial planners and accountants sort of haven't been able to work together harmoniously. I've heard a lot of stories about how they've sort of, there's been a lot of angst. Um, there's still a little bit of a turf war in the media. So can you perhaps give us a couple of tips for what you think might be a good way for accountants and financial planners to work together harmoniously and successfully? Thanks, Vicky. That's a great question. Um, look, it's one for, for many years uh, that we as an industry have uh, have struggled with and it's one that um, that I've seen over many many years over the, the 28 years I've been in the industry where where it does work so I guess two tips I can give there and what we do spell out to to our members is that you must have a business services agreement or a memorandum of understanding between you and the financial planner often where I've seen it fall apart is that both parties don't understand um, what each party is going to do in the advice process. So um, we recommend that to be um, to put in place right up front. And uh, personally, uh, the business that I lead up, we, we do that. Um, we provide that sort of service so both parties understand where the advice hands off. Um, I can talk to you. I spoke to many of you yesterday about strategic advice and uh, how you're in the best position to be providing that strategic SMSF advice, but nowhere to hand off for the insurance and investment and portfolio implementation advice to a planner and, uh, and realise who does what. So, so an agreement, I would say, is, is the number one tip. Um, the, the second thing there that I would point out to all of you, 
uh, a tip there in working with planners is to understand understand how to price up effectively strategic advice. I think this is where a lot of accountants have given away a lot over the years and uh, you've been giving it off as tax advice and probably haven't priced it appropriately and that's one of the things through our accounting connections and our accounting experience that we, we can help you with. So my two tips would be one, get the agreement in place to begin with and two, to be educated on strategic advice and, and that's what we do in our our workshop that I explained to you yesterday about the transition to licensing program. Right, thank you. Um, Matt, you come from a large organisation that deals a lot with consumers. And I was reading recently a report from Business Blades connecting with consumers that revealed the trust is not the problem. In fact, consumers are confused about what financial planners actually do. So how would you describe the value proposition to be able to persuade consumers and even perhaps doubting accountants about the value of obtaining professional financial advice? So let me start by saying um, when working with in order to answer that, I think we have to actually go back to the previous question that you just raised, which is how do you work effectively with a specialist within your business or in a business that's aligned to your own, that specialist being a financial advisor? Uh, we actually think there are two things you've got to get right up front. The first one is you need to be really clear about why you're doing it. What is it? What is there in this for your business and for you personally as the owner of the business? That's the first thing. Uh, related to that is what's it? What's in it for the client? Why are you looking to provide these services? So if you place the client at the centre, you think about your client, you think about the service needs they have, what is it that you're looking to provide to them you can't currently do yourself? And by consequence, from that position, determine what services you believe an, a financial advisor can add to an accounting practice like your own. If you then take that view and you think about uh, the introduction of a financial advisor, a specialist within your practice, somebody who is potentially part of your business services firm, then I think we get to a couple of really interesting opportunities for the articulation of value. The first of those from mine, and I'm uh, both the licensee of a financial, uh, financial advice business but also the client of a financial advisor, the first of them is a very clear articulation by the client with the client and for the client of their goals and objectives in life. Um, it's very, very easy to not take the time to get to the heart of things that matter. Uh, it's very easy to deal to facts and figures in isolation from goals and aspirations. So one of the clear value propositions of the introduction of financial advice is the, is the creation of space and time to explore client needs. For those of you who work with SME clients, many of you would experience from time to time the, the feeling that you know you can offer more value to the client by doing the consulting work, but you get tied up doing the BAS or doing the, the, the non-consulting work, the compliance work that you have in front of you every day because you are, uh, if you're like most accountants, we deal with your time poor. So I think the number one value proposition that can actually be bought is the creation of time and space and capability to explore unmet client needs. From my perspective as a, as a client of a financial advice firm, which is a multidiscipline practice run by a CPA, um, it's not just the fact that they're doing my accounts. That, in fact, is just an outcome of the process. It's much, much more the fact that they've created a space and time for my wife and I, and we've got four kids, to be very clear about what our goals and aspirations are. And we're happy to pay very fully for that and all of the services that come along with it. Great. Thank you, Matt. So, Grant. Um, transitioning to an advisory practice is a long-term commitment and I've spent a lot of time talking to our members to try and get that message across because once they've made the business decision that this is a space they want to go into, it's not going to be a case of almost overnight success sort of thing. It does take time and it's a long-term commitment. So how long do you would you say before it starts to pay off and what can members actually expect and what sort of value and benefits do you, th do you think they can derive in the longer term? That's a very interesting question, Vicky. Um, <laughs> transitioning, uh, how many of you now are already in a financial planning uh, 
practice or or on a JV. Put your hands up. So I've got one. So there's not too many. So there's a lot of people in in the room that need to consider where you're at from a from an advice perspective. Um, the first and foremost thing I'd say in, in transitioning is you actually have to decide what you want to transition to. So do you want to transition to your own AFSL? Do you want to transition to the ability to give full financial advice where you recommend product? Do you want to establish a joint venture where you can just refer to a trusted uh, relationship? Or do you want to just be able to do what you're doing now, a lot of you, in regard to giving self-managed super advice under the, the regulated term of uh, class of product? And I think you'd all understand what that is. Well, you know, we're 18 months into the, uh, into the uh, what I call the free period. You've got 18 months to go. So some decisions need to be made. I'm going to uh, use this little sheet here and uh, I just happen to have it with me. For those of you that have been to the capstone stand outside, <laughs> there's a chart here that's going to help you. And if you haven't got one, go and have a look at it. It, it, it might have a solution of independence being capstone, but it also has a solution to the side being our partnered groups here. And Vicky's right, in the tender process, you have the best groups in the country. Um, so it depends on what you want to do, independence or, or institution, but this will help you decide no matter what. So I'd suggest to you to grab one of those and have a look at it. But uh, Can I take one? Uh, yes, Matt, <laughs> I, I, I think Excellent. you can. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Wonderful organisation, BT. <laughs> okay, so the key fact is you've got to make that decision. And I think a lot of you have been putting it off. And I know that the IPA have been uh, very strong. Vicky, uh, every time she has an article in the press, is pushing decision time, decision time. Well, it is. You guys and girls have got to make a call February, March next year. Because if you need to do some RG146, whatever institution you align with or independent, we'll all facilitate that for you. So don't be frightened of it, but make the decision. Get over the line. The other key factor is the outcome that you want. Um, if, we def you know, if we define payoff, and that was one of the, the key words Vicky used, um, the payoff will depend on what path you take. So if you just want a payoff in dollars and cents, then you've got to look at that under the structure of where you go full advice, a JV where you refer it out and you earn some revenue or class of product and ch charge a fee-based environment there. Um, there's a lot of accountants we talk to that are really keen just to be able to talk about self-managed super, keep doing what you're doing, have a quality referral relationship with an advisor, which leads to greater client satisfaction. That's part of the payoff. I think there could be more. I think uh, I think Stuart mentioned about you know looking at, at at the dollar cost and making sure that you are earning something from the opportunities that you're providing. That's really important. And the other thing, no matter what industry you're in, you want to put a corral around your clients so that they don't wander. And the real key with that is multiple services to your client. Lock them in to you. So whether you provide it whether you provide it through a referral association or whether you do the full product gamut yourself, as long as you're doing something. Um, the other thing is everyone's expectations are going to be different. And, and working with you know, one of the AFSL providers here will, will help you look at that, at what your investment into the process is and what expense that will cost and what return you'll get from it. If you choose to provide a class of product service, then you can charge appropriately for that. Now, I know lots of accountants that do that now, charge inside your accounting, uh, accounting dollars, like your annual fees. That's fine. Or you can charge separately as a financial planning opportunity and start to build a recurring revenue base through the financial planning, which my understanding is an accounting base value is one times. Is that right? Any takers on that? Better one-time multiple on an accounting base? Less? Who knows what a financial planning base runs at? Fee-based. Anyone know? The market runs anywhere between two to three. You know, so let's, let's call it two and a half. 
Big difference. Have a think about that in what you establish. So, at the end of the day, the benefits, client retention, client satisfaction. What I'd say is an alternate revenue stream is there for you. Um, you've got a higher multiple sale value if you develop that financial planning revenue stream, but the overall business value starts to skyrocket. So, you know, there, there's, there's a few components to that, and, and I'd say that grab one of those sheets, it'll guide you, go to the stand, the end result will be that you should align with one of the people here for your authorisation. I personally don't believe accountants should be getting their own AFSLs unless you are going to grow a genuine financial business of scale. Capstone has a lot of planning business. We just opened up one uh, three months ago. Sorry, I'm taking a bit of time, Vicky, but we just opened up one three months ago, the third biggest accounting business in the ACT. And we built their business from scratch because they wanted their own business. So we've got three financial advisors, sorry, two and a half in there with them now to grow and service their business. We've got a lot of SMSF funds, financial planning. Others, you've got a one-man band or a JV. Whatever way you need to go, I don't believe you should be going for your own licence. That's my opinion. Um, and I think there's a lot of, a lot of negatives about that, not just cost but time and what you believe you should be doing. So with that, uh, transitioning, big question, a lot of options. Great. Thanks, Grant. Uh, Dan, um, when I've been talking to accountants over the last five years about financial services, and the IPA has been talking a lot about members and accountants growing and diversifying their practices around financial services. However, one of the biggest stumbling blocks that's always thrown back at me is by practitioners who are either sole practitioners or in very small firms. And they just see that they've got no capacity, no ability to move into things like financial services. So can you maybe give us some ideas of how they might be able to overcome some of those challenges? Um, I might just um, ask a quick question of the audience. Who here is a sole practitioner? Um, okay. Good, thank you. Uh, I have seen, uh, been in the industry about 25 odd years. Um, as I get older, I'm actually talking years down. <laughs> I used to talk it up, but now I've only been 25, actually 27, but I say <laughs> I've capped it at 25. Um, so the, the thing I've seen is sole practitioners work on a referral basis with other financial planners, and I've seen it work successfully. I've seen sole practitioners work as authorised reps of various dealer groups uh, successfully and uh, um, they've been very good relationships. And I've seen sole practitioners and still see them with a their own AFSLs and be successfully. So if you're a sole practitioner, it doesn't preclude you from one of the options. Uh, the preclusion of one of the options is really your own head sp space, what you want to do. Um, one of the important things is really treat it like a client coming into the accounting business and saying, Hi, I've decided I want to diversify my business into a similar sort of industry. What are your thoughts? And you'd sit down with that client, you'd say, okay, tell me about your business. What are you trying to do? Understand what are the clients? So as an as accountant, I'd say, what is your current client base? Are they the sort of client base they'll be seeking financial advice? In other words, have they got money to actually invest or superannuation or what are their assets or is it key management? What is it of, that, of your client base they need advice on around financial planning. What percentage of your current client place already has a financial planner? You could assume you're not going to probably target those people or you're not going to be that successful. So you're trying to you know, filter your business model. If you pick up your existing clients and you can get more into financial planning, what revenue stream do you think you can generate off that client base? And will financial planning expand your client base? Is it something that can actually go out and find additional clients? And, okay, what is a monetize the value of that? So try to, you know, no different to a client coming to you, work out a business plan and work out a sort of a cash flow of what that might generate. Then you look at the costs of doing it. And, yes, if you refer it, it's a great idea and it's, a, it's probably the most cost-effective way of putting very limited overheads on your business and time and effort. If you go as an authorised rep, there are costs associated with authorised rep and at the very end I'll talk about the, 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 the prenup. And then, um, then if you get your own AFSL, it is more expensive. It's probably a cost of around 20 to 30 grand 
per year as a minimum on top as if you'd just been an authorised rep. And so my mindset would be you need to be generating at least $15 million of funds under management or be able to find $15 million, $15 million of farm or $20 million of farm under management to justify having an AFSL over an AR. Everyone's talking about, and we'll talk about, you know, the benefits of joining up. But it is a marriage, and it's an unusual marriage because it's a marriage based on money. And uh, Hollywood's a good example of money, <laughs> marriages based on money. Uh, there's always a prenup, and it's, don't be embarrassed to talk about the prenup, you know, on the first date. You know, what's going to happen? We're all going to have a great time, but in the morning, what's going <laughs> to... So be very clear. This is actually Dan's counselling yeah. session. <laughs> <laughs> uh, It'll be okay, Dan. Uh, uh, I actually want to know what actually yeah. happens that first night. <laughs> I didn't mention a cigarette. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, be very clear of who owns the client, but also what products you're going into. Because you can go into some products which are aligned to the dealer group that you're joining, and you can move that money quite easily, and some are pretty hard damn to move. So just be clear on that. Um, client ownership. Uh, so get the print up right. Uh, if you get that right, then, you know, the start point's actually not too bad from there because then you have, you know, you're going into the relationship eyes wide open. If I can steal that Tom Cruise movie. Or was that shut? <laughs> I, I, I think it was eyes wide shut. That was a Stanley shut. Kubrick movie. Um, <laughs> one of the things we've got to keep in mind with this, though, is why are you doing it? Why are you doing this in the first instance? Are you doing it to protect a revenue stream? In which case, you're doing it for the wrong reason. You've got to go back and have a look at the business plan that you've got, what it actually enables in terms of your own life goals. Are you running your business at the moment to provide cash flow, essentially? Have you bought yourself a job with the capital that you've invested? Or alternatively, are you running it for a liquidity outcome at some stage in the future? You know, we, we work very closely with Bob Neal, who's in the audience from Seaview Consulting. And it's extraordinary the amount of work that we see come through his network and advisors and accountants that we see who haven't really figured out why they're in business. What is it they're doing? What is it that motivates them to do it? What is it they're trying to achieve out of their business? And it's extraordinary the number of your colleagues who don't run your businesses as a business. I, don't, I wouldn't want to ask each of you how big your lockup is, but we've seen businesses of lockup of 120, 140, 150 days. Now, I'm sure that's none of you, but your colleagues aren't running proper businesses. They're running at best cash flow or a salary and wages book for themselves and for their family. And that starts to become really problematic. So I think great advice from Dan, but you've got to be really clear about are you running away from a problem, as in you're trying to protect a revenue stream, or you're trying to build a business? And if you are trying to build a business, are you running it for a lifestyle uh, solution today or a liquidity outcome tomorrow? Because you'll make very different decisions once you're clear on those choices. Um, okay, so I'll ask another question now of Tony. Um, we've heard a lot from Government and Treasury about the introduction of scaled advice under FOFA, and this is going to be a great thing for the 80% of consumers who don't seek financial advice. Do you think that the introduction of scaled advice is actually going to drive demand from consumers? And have you seen any early evidence of this coming out of the industry? Uh, short answer to that is absolutely. We've actually been practising scaled advice since um, the first day we created the licence. Uh, we've got dem demonstrable examples of how accountants under our licence are actually making good fees from scaled advice. Now, I'm going to assume that no one knows what scaled advice is, but there is actually a regulatory guide that ASIC issued back in 2013, uh, RG244. But they actually introduced scaled advice way back in 2005 with RG90. They actually gave an example of how you actually can give a limited form of advice documented in a statement of advice to your clients. So it actually go, goes back quite a ways. What scaled advice and RG244 has now done is actually formalised it because then they did some more consumer research and what that consumer research showed to ASIC was that 90% or slightly more than 90% of consumers didn't actually value financial advice and certainly weren't prepared to pay for it. That's what the basis of RG244 was all about. 
So we've created our license specifically around the ability for you to actually scale up your advice, which all that simply means, excuse me, is that <coughs> you've got a spectrum of advice. Everything from your basic providing your client with some general information all the way through to providing comprehensive advice across all of the client's circumstances and needs. In between, you've got opportunities to provide different forms of advice depending on that client's circumstances at that very point in time. So for instance, we're all here to mainly to hear about SMSF advice and how you actually give advice around SMSFs. That is actually scaled advice. Because what you're looking at at that particular point in time is, how can I help my client with their SMSF? Should I actually recommend that they set up an SMSF, and therefore, which you've got an exemption for at the moment, but in a year and a half's time you won't? But then what, what are you going to tell them about contributions? What are you going to tell them about their existing superannuation? They want to go and borrow some, some money to actually buy investment property or shares within their super fund. What are you going to do about that? So that's where scaled advice starts to come in in terms of you can scale based on how many issues you're actually addressing with the client. The less of the number of issues, the more it's, it's basically considered to be limited advice. The more issues, you're starting to progress more towards comprehensive form of advice and therefore you have to actually do more fact-finding with your client and provide more comprehensive advice. Now most accounts we talk to don't want to go down that, that particular track. That said, uh, you've got the ability these days, not only through this regulatory environment we're actually now in, but you've also got the delivery mechanisms to be able to you know, automate virtually 60-70% of this total process now. Right? Makes your job a hell of a lot easier if you want to go down that track. So if you think there's going to be a lot of paperwork, yeah, there absolutely is going to be paperwork. But a lot of it's now delivered by technology and automation, just like what's happening in cloud accounting world these days. So will consumers drive demand for scaled advice? Most consumers wouldn't have a clue what scaled advice is. What's going to drive it is the delivery from people such as yourselves. So for those who are interested in stepping into this new world and don't necessarily want to go down the track of full comprehensive advice, particularly things around, like most accounts I talk to, don't want to offer comprehensive investment advice. And that's perfectly understandable. But there are opportunities to provide very limited scale advice around investment opportunities, which you can actually generate some revenue. Anything else that you're uncomfortable with, that's what you refer to a specialist. So for instance, from our perspective, we have a panel of specialists you can refer your clients to. We actually don't have a panel of financial planners. We know financial planners and we can refer a financial planner, but we take the view that the accountant can provide a certain level of advice that you're comfortable in, and then you can refer it to a specialist on our panel. Or if you know somebody else who is a specialist, say, in direct shares, you can actually refer your clients to that particular specialist to provide specialist advice around direct shares in this MSF portfolio. So in summary, uh, are consumers going to drive it? No, you guys are going to drive it. My personal view is financial planners uh, have been fighting scaled advice and fighting things like general advice, whereas our view is that consumers absolutely want those sorts of advice services offered to them and let them choose how far they actually want to go. So it's your choice. I'm more than happy to discuss it with anybody after the session. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, everyone. OK, let's open it to the floor. Have we got some questions? Must be at least one question. Elizabeth, at the front here. Oh, Tony's gone over there. We'll start over there and we'll come back to you. Thanks. Oh, hi. I've got a question about um, the scaled advice. And do you have an obligation with a client to ask them then or just briefly explain what is available in financial advice before you ask them what they actually want so that they don't miss out on anything, if you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, look, absolutely. Um, before you actually enter into advising a client, you, there is actually a requirement for you to hand over what's called a financial services guide and explain the contents of that, which a lot of it is around your capacity and what you're able to actually advise in. So that's just the discussion where you go, this is what I can provide and this is what I can, can provide to you specifically. 
alternatively you want anything outside of that scope of advice, then I can refer you to someone or you can go and get your own advice. So you, you have that conversation right up front. The other thing that you need to be aware of is, um, you, obviously with FOFA now, you've got this thing about the best interest duty, but combined with that is you have to provide advice that is appropriate to your client. That particular part of the Corporations Act has actually not gone. It hasn't been replaced by best interest duty. It actually combines with best interest duty. So there's always this question around, you know, is scaled advice, if you're providing a restricted form of advice in the best interest of client, if it's appropriate to your client, absolutely it's in the best interest of your client. How are you going to know that, though? I beg your pardon? How are you going to know that unless you basically can offer them everything? That's what I'm a bit confused about. Again, it boils down to, you know, we've got, say, two-thirds of our accountants under our licence who are only at this stage providing a restricted form of advice around self-managed super funds and superannuation. So the scope is in the FSG right up front. When the client starts to ask other questions, clearly you've got to be saying, I can't advise you on that, but I'm more than happy to refer you to someone. So do that's you, made very clear. Okay, so do you, does your organisation give the options to provide more advice than just SMSF? Absolutely. If you've, if you've got the appropriate minimum RG for 146 qualifications and you're authorised for all of those, okay. absolutely, then your FSG reflects what you want to actually do. Okay. Because what, what you have to remember here is that if we take a step back, RG146 actually doesn't contemplate something called diploma of financial planning. It doesn't contemplate anything called an advanced diploma. What it basically says is you need generic knowledge, you need specialist knowledge in your particular specialisation, and then you have to do some skills training, which is how you actually deliver the advice to your client. Right, so don't get confused around things like diploma of financial planning. If all you want to do is specialise, say, in superannuation, SMSF, and even things like basic deposit products, like cash management and term deposits, as long as you can demonstrate you've got the specialised specialist knowledge in those particular areas, then you can actually get authorised to do that. Mm. If you want to add down the track, you can add and then become authorised appropriately. Yeah. Grant, you want the, to add something? The, just to continue on from that, there's a couple, couple of other elements that, that might give you a bit more guidance. No matter what, in this new, this new uh, regulated regime, you're going to have to do a uh, data collection form or some people call it a client information questionnaire. So you're going to have to have that completed. Under the licensing at the moment, uh, you know, RG146 is required, but at the moment um, there is an accountant's exemption available that can be utilised for you to get the licensing. The key with the class of product advice is Capstone run two levels. Tier one means you can open and close SMSFs, talk about personal super, talk about uh, basic term deposit type products. Tier two with us is full class of product advice, which means you can talk about uh, managed funds, equities, risk insurance, personal super, open and close, that type of thing. So there's two levels. Ultimately, though, you do need to have your RG146 in place by the 1st of July 2016. No matter what, you still need to go through a financial planning oriented process whereby when you meet the client, you have to give them the FSG, as Tony said, um, you have to give them a privacy statement and your licensees will have these documents stock standard for you to pass them on. You'll also give them what's called an advisor profile. <coughs> then you'll enter into the fact finding mission um, or using technology, you'll have sent it to them saying, please complete it and bring it with you to our meeting. Scout advice can, can, can roll from that, but you can talk about all those other elements, but not from a product perspective. If you want to talk product, it's a different level of licensing, or you have your referral relationship or your JV or whatever. So okay. that's just a sort of a broader view of it. Okay, let's move to a second question with Elizabeth. Thank you, that's very interesting. Um, my problem is, I, at the moment I'm referring, okay, so I, I have a client that wants insurance or wants this or that. I have a financial planner that I work with. But what I found was that, um, say for instance, they have a self-managed super fund and they say, okay, we have real estate in it and we have some cash, now we want to um, have a share portfolio. 
most financial planners that I talked to didn't have somebody within their organization that could do the stockbroking. I had to go yet to somebody else. But then that somebody else also does stuff that financial planners do. So all of a sudden, there's a bit of a tag of war. Who is going to get the client? And I find that takes away from my desire to help the client any further because I think, well, I'm going to lose that client to this, this other broker that is also a financial planner who takes away clients from my financial planner. So... Can I, can I have a crack at answering that one? Yeah. You need a better advisor. <laughs> to be blunt, you need a better referral partner. You need to look at the skills and capability required to help service your client base and go and meet somebody that is philosophically aligned to what it is you're trying to do for your clients, who is structured in a way to meet the service demands that you place on yourself to service those clients and who appropriately can actually deliver the services that you're looking for in the client base. No way would I be leaving yourself in a situation that you are at the moment where your referral service refers out to somebody else. Um, yeah. any, of the, any of the licensees here would be able to and more than happy to help you uh, find somebody, go through a process, an RFP type process to find the person that should be working with your client base. There's okay. no way you should be having yourself in that situation. Okay, no, thank it's you. All, it's all about alignment. You know, your thoughts, your clients, what they need and the right advisor. And then, you know, you've just got to make the call, institution or independent. That's easy. <laughs> okay, any more questions? We've got some more minutes. Anybody want to ask about the cost of licensing? Far less than the value it creates. <laughs> and, of course, it's all can about I, the value. Before we jump into that, can I just circle back to the, to the, limited, the limited scope advice uh, question? The one thing you, there's two things you've got to keep in mind here. The first thing is as soon as you move out of the accountant's exemption regime into the, into the license regime, you've got a bunch of documentation you've got to hand over. I think that's really crucial. You've now got a new process you've got to enter into. The second thing that I think is really important to understand here, with the wine back that the Coalition for Common Sense, I think it was, the wine back that was created in the Senate last week, has created a level of ambiguity around the, the last step in the best interest duty process, which in essence, to paraphrase, says, and anything else you think you should have thought about for the client. Um, there, are, there will remain for a period of time a level of ambiguity in this area because we don't have any FOS determinations, because we don't have any uh, case law, and the regulatory guidance is broad at best at this point in time. So. Um, scaled advice is incredibly important. It's been around, as I think Grant said to, my, to myself earlier, limited advice, scaled advice, advice that's appropriate to your client has been around for hopefully as long as the industry that's moving towards a profession has been around. Um, you guys do it with your clients every day. But there is, we are in an unusual environment at the moment and there will be ambiguity for quite some time. Okay. I think we had, sorry, we had Linda there and then one here. Hi, um, having been an AR in the past, um, I did actually find it extremely difficult to find someone who would work with me, not based purely on what I could turn over in my practice from doing financial planning, but to be able to actually provide a cost effective way of me being an AR without having millions and millions of millions of dollars, I guess, of FUM um, or referral work or however you want to look at it. Um, I like to be able to provide that service to my client, that added value, but find it a really difficult thing to find someone who's willing to work with someone in a small practice who's not driving just about the dollars but, but, but about the value. I might have a go at that okay. one. Um, with, with uh, I know the other licensee um, here uh, probably say the same thing and, and we're all very similar in this respect, but... Um, SMSF advice, we, we are purely, uh, we just charge a fee for the service. Uh, we don't sort of focus on turnover or percentage of turnover. So we're, we're quite different to the way a lot of licensees operate in the marketplace. And I've managed a number of those licensees over the, over the years. So if um, that's why I say because we're accountancy specific with your interests at heart and only focusing on accountants and only licensing accountants, we're purely fee based and comply with with uh, your APES 230 guidelines, etc. Um, 
So it's important to know that, I think, particularly in, in building a business. And the question Matt sort of raised before about why are you doing this is very, very relevant. And that's what we sort of sit down with you and have a very strong and, and informative discussion about. Yeah, look, I, I fully agree, Stuart's right. Capstone run for accountants on here to tier two. I think you were talking about cost, yeah. like our tier one authorisation runs at three and a half thousand dollars as a flat fee. Our tier two runs at seven thousand dollars as a flat fee, includes your PI. That's exactly right. The final, yeah. <laughs> He's stumped. Um, but in the financial planning world, Historically, and we've all ran these channels uh, or built them, you know, there was a, a commission split or a flat fee plus. And, you know, it, if you were only generating a small amount of revenue and you are paying a very high commission split, it's not worth it. But in a genuine um, environment that can support and develop the accounting uh, opportunities and the accounting authorisations, then, you know, it's costed in a different way so that it is effective... And the other thing is, you know, it includes training and compliance support, things like that. So, you know, yeah, so Definitely I think that's yeah, probably sure. part of the reason that the IPA, you know, has selected uh, this group of, uh, of um, AFSL operators. The you've best. got the two biggest. <laughs> you've got the two, virtually the two biggest, and then one of the next biggest with IOOF. Um, I've been fortunate, I've been in the industry 35 years and uh, I was a general manager with AMP and with uh, IOOF and they're wonderful institutions. Uh, so, they, yeah, I think, you know, the world's changed. Because I must say, um, in my travels talking to members, um, I've had so many members say to me that they can't find advisors who are prepared to deal with mum and dad clients. So one of the things we did when we went to tender was put that specifically in there, that we wanted to partner with licensees who were prepared to deal with all types of clients, not sort of the high end or whatever. So that was a really, really important thing for us. And also licensees that were prepared to put the time in to help sole practitioners and very small firms make the transition. Yeah. So we had a question here, I think? Yeah. I suppose it's just that um, along those lines in terms of sole practitioners wanting to move well, basically, we just want to do what we've been doing. Yeah. Mm. Um, we don't want to be financial planners. We don't want mm. to go down that track. Um, and so we've got client bases that, you know, traditionally we've just done what we've done and that's all we want. They don't want financial advice. We're moving now to an environment where you're making us join up with these associations and regardless of what the cost is, how do we recoup that from clients who really, as far as they're concerned, is... <laughs> you're doing for me exactly what you did for me last year. Why all of a sudden have I got these extra costs involved? So I'm, it might be cheap, et cetera, to, for all reasonable <laughs> costings for us to join with you. But a, a new clients, maybe we can educate them mm. and teach them. But there's not a lot of education happening to the public out there at large that mm. they now have to comply with different um, situations and circumstances. And we then become the teachers, I suppose, and the educators. Um, and, you know, you've got a super fund that, you know, that turns up or somebody comes along and they're, price, they're pricing, how much can you do it for? How much can you do it for? Um, and they're getting the cheapest prices they can get. How do we mm. then move on from that and still have a reasonable business <laughs> that we can make profitability from? It's, so let me, let me jump into that. I'm sure the others, uh, maybe Tony will have a view given some of the firms that he works with. Um, the world has changed. Uh, and that's the reality you've got to face into. Um, you can't keep doing what you did yesterday, tomorrow, in 18 months' time. I'm not sure that maths made sense, but you know what I mean. Once the new licensing regime comes in, the world's different. You have to. One of the challenges, I think, for accounting, the accounting fraternities and a place where I think the IPA plays in quite well is the support of somebody like a licensee equivalent in the accounting world to help you run a better business. Um, the ability... I, I disagree with your comment... Um, respectfully, where you said your clients don't want financial services. I disagree because I reckon they don't know they need it. They may not want to pay for it, but they sure as hell need it. If you look at the underinsurance problem in Australia, there is nobody better place to deal with that problem than you. How many of you have had widows, husbands or wives, come in with you and go, Bill's dead, Beth's dead, what do I do? You are better placed than anybody else in Australia to fix that problem for every single one of your clients. They just don't know they need it. 
So I reckon there is a great opportunity to take the enormous advocacy that your clients have with you to turn them from the cost conversation to a value conversation because of the insights you have of them and the relationship and trust that they place in you. So I think there's a great opportunity here and I don't think it's about what the licensee costs. I think it's about the value you can create for your client base doing the right thing for them and the value that you can create in your own business should you choose to go down that path. I might, I might just add to what Matt's saying there because um, you might have remembered yesterday in the session if you came to it that I ran that I talked about investment trends and the research. Look, I could, if I could recommend to, to all of you here, you know, if you want to have a look at some of that research, just Google investment trends uh, 2014 um, or just email uh, Mark or myself and we can provide you some copies of, of some slides that really articulate that quite well because your clients do expect this from you. That's what the research is showing. Um, they really need it. And the, the other thing is, I think um, just to add to what Matt said, part of the, part of the uh, things that I found with a lot of accountants that have joined our group is the real simple things, like what do I say? Well, how do I communicate to my clients? How, Stuart, how do, I, how do I talk about this new service I'm offering? So we've done things like create marketing letters for you, client letters, inf information letters and seminar, seminar programs and so forth. And it's essential. You'll find from all the licensees here on the panel that we have a range of services to help you in this area, which um, maybe accountants haven't been accustomed to that in this type of relationship before. We do provide a lot of advice and a lot of support. I, I can say to, and I can't speak obviously for your clients, but all the research, and I mean all the research shows that there is huge client demand for different financial services and there is an advice gap. And, you know, over 300,000 SMSFs have identified that they've got an advice gap. And, and you know, the research shows which particular areas, etc. And they're happy to pay for it. The, the research says they're happy exactly. to pay for it, which is yeah. a great opportunity. Yeah, but but it's about reframing the conversation. I think yeah. you're right. We need to help with that. Mm. Mm. Okay, just got one, one question here. We've got a question here and then we've got a question. So the microphone's down there. So a quick question down there and then another quick question there because we're actually now flashing over time. Mine's more of an observation. Um, I, I'm an, actually a financial planner, not an accountant, um, but I work with accountants and what we find is when we do meetings together, it's so much more productive. So one of the issues I guess I have as a financial planner is <clears throat> you've got to do your apprenticeship like, it's like me becoming an accountant. I can have a bit of paper that says I can do it, but I need to go and work with accountants to learn how to do it and how to, and what to look for. It's the same if you move into financial planning. So I, I guess for me, being the outsider looking in, it's working out how do you move from and the question before, how do we identify what to do with clients? So you've got to do your apprenticeship. So unless the licensee is providing ongoing training and education, it's going to be a tough gig. Um, just, just an observation. No, that's terrific. Thank you. OK, so one last quick question here. Um, our client base really needs financial advice. By the hey, going to financial planners, because financial planners in the past, they have ripped them off with commissions. That's their perception. Are you able to help us to provide services to our clients with no commission associated at all? Absolutely. I think, yeah. I think all of us would say yes to, yeah. to that. Yes. It's a matter, like I think uh, the lady over here before, it's a matter of selecting the right type of advisor referral relationship for your business and your clients and ensuring that it's a fee-based relationship so that there's no commissions, it's all fee-driven. And, like the gentleman just said, the real key is that you're part of that initial discussion with the financial advisor and the client. Will you be able to rebate the commissions from personal risk insurance back to the clients after 12 months? Oh, there, there's various ways that can be, those, yes. those elements yes. can be done, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's easy. Mm. Yeah. Just, okay. just be wary. Just be wary that margins can be built into the products being provided to you. So they're not commissions. It's the mer. 
the management expense ratio of the platform or even the funds they're recommending. So it's not, it's not technically a hidden commission, but it's a margin built in that could be compensating a very cheap service being provided to you. And those you know, margin things, can, how can it be disclosed to the clients? Because the clients are funding now through their current portfolio, they're paying massive amount of fees, and they feel very upset because they have been ripped off because those fees have not been disclosed to them at, at the beginning. Again, it's all about having the right relationship with the right advisor. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, far from all the research we did, we find probably Dover is an independent advisor. We're not going with them because it's one main show. Uh, but we still we can find anybody who might be members will be satisfied that we can join an organization that will not charge commissions to the clients and the clients will receive fee for service. Don't well, worry. you've got five great options here. I was just going to say, we've, there's a lot of assistance here. We've done the hard work in picking the best in the market for you. Um, some of our partners are out there. Um, so please feel free to go and talk to any of them and all of us, including me, at any point in time. Unfortunately, we're out of time now, so I want to thank you all very much. And can you please thank our panellists? <laughs>